I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 for a message which I am entitling Unparalleled, Unparalleled, for that truly is who Jesus is. We have just come through the Christmas season and we have considered how that Jesus was prophesied his birth, his life, his ministry, his death. But here at the outset of Matthew, we are given in the, the briefest synopsis a glimpse of how unparalleled Jesus truly is. Matthew chapter 1 tells us of this one who was a descendant of Abraham, he was born of the Jewish line. And he was not only born of what all of the Jewish nation traced its lineage back to, the great man Abraham, the man of faith, but he came through the royal line of David, which you might say was a tremendous feather in anyone's cap. But... There were many who could trace their lineage back to David. Here was one who was unlike any of the others. But the heritage, the lineage, was vitally important, for the Messiah was to come through David into the world. And so we have it described, also the miraculous conception of Jesus, and how that he was to be born in Bethlehem. Then chapter 2, the visit of the Magi. Many times immediately after Christmas, because the Magi did not appear immediately along with the shepherds, though in a nativity scene it might seem that that was the case, the Magi perhaps came months after the birth of Jesus Christ, seeking out him who had been born king of the Jews. Of course, Herod the king, Herod the great in Jerusalem, and all Jerusalem because of his tyrannical power and because of he, he was such a wild man, so unpredictable, the whole city was unnerved when Herod the great became disturbed by this news and these men who came seeking the new king of the Jews. The, the magi, the wise men, they go, they find Jesus, and they bring their treasures and they lay them before him. The earthly treasures brought to honor him who could never be honored enough. They lay their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It must have been eye-opening to Mary and Joseph. We suspect that they were of tremendously humble means. For them to receive gold and frankincense and myrrh, those spices and those things which people would labor and save for months and years and years in order to obtain just a small supply. The Magi, they make their way off to their own homeland, very definitely choosing to skirt around Jerusalem, taking a different road. Mary and Joseph, they go down farther south and off into Egypt, there to await the death of Herod the Great. Herod, in his mad frenzy that he might stamp out this newborn king, he kills who knows how many babies, how many little infants aged two years and under there in the vicinity of Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph, they learn of the death of Herod the Great, and they return back, but rather than making Bethlehem their home, 
they returned to Nazareth in the north, that Jesus might be known as a Nazarene. Now chapter 3, and I want to read what takes place here. As Jesus is thrown into the midst of the beginning of his ministry. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." When you come to read the Gospel of Mark, the second evangelist of the New Testament, you come across the word immediately, repeatedly. Immediately this happened, and immediately that happened, and Mark gives us in brief snippets the action of Jesus' life. That was very intentional, Mark, or John Mark, as we often refer to him, John Mark was writing primarily to a Roman audience, which was not very patient, and they were eager to have the details quickly. Matthew, he is addressing primarily Jews, and we pick this up from how many times he brings forth the heritage of Jesus, to show that here is the long-awaited one. Here is the one who we, we Jewish men and women, have been looking for and believing that God would send, that God had not forgotten about us. But Matthew, 
is not outdone in any way by Mark in how quickly he brings forth what he has to give us. Once again, we consider how that chapter 1 was the heritage, it was the background, it was the lineage of Jesus. And Jesus is shown there to be without parallel. Then the miracle of the virgin birth. Joseph, he knew that he wasn't the father, yet he saw that there was something taking place in Mary's body, and the angel comes to him and says, Joseph, Fear not to take unto yourself Mary as your wife. And Joseph is obedient. The angel was essentially saying that God is up to something which has never taken place. This is an unparalleled event. An unparalleled person is coming into the world to do an unparalleled event event or sacrifice, to make that sacrifice. Then chapter 2, we have Jesus as he comes to be born, and Mary and Joseph, having made their way down to Bethlehem from Nazareth, there is also the honor that is given to him in the coming of the Magi. There is much pain that takes place, this world knows nothing of the goodness of God, and it rebels, it kicks, it fights. You read about this in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, how that this world disdains the goodness of God. But chapter 3 now, our focus today, Matthew chapter 3, again, as Jesus comes, we are shown the unparalleled character of who he is. John the Baptist was a remarkable individual. He, in similar way, though not identical, John the Baptist, we learn from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, was also a miraculous baby. His parents they had never had a child before, and they had given up. There was really no hope. But God steps into the scene, and all of a sudden, Elizabeth, who had been barren, and her husband, well past those days, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they are told that they are going to have a son. And so John the Baptist he comes and he is born and he grows and he becomes mighty in the word of God and in the proclamation of the word of God. If Jesus had never come, John would stand head and shoulders with all of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Elijah, Jeremiah, every last one of them John the Baptist would rightly be there on a level along with them. But see what John does. John, he comes and he is preaching in the wilderness and he is baptizing, calling people to repent that good gospel word. Repent, a word that this world so disdains. I, I just am amazed how that people recoil, even believers, even church people, they recoil. Silliest thing that I ever heard in my life was a man who had gone to church all of his life say to me, you know, the Bible speaks very little about repentance. And I wondered what, in, what Bible he was reading out of. John the Baptist, he comes, and his message is repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Many were coming to him. Many broken and contrite. And they were being baptized. Others, they came 
But they were not broken in their hearts. John looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees and he saw beyond the exterior and he looked to the heart and he says to them, you brood of vipers. Imagine sitting in church and the preacher looking straight at you in the eye and saying, you brood of vipers. I'm sure you wouldn't be very impressed. But this was his message, and he says to them, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There's that word once again. But John was saying, there needs to be not just lip service, there needs to be actions which complement and which go in line and which are in concert with the words of proclamation or confession, repentance, that you so, so zealously adhere to, you say. Do not say, do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham. You can't tie in your lineage in a physical way to this. There needs to be a true heart change, a transformation of repentance, because God is able to raise up out of these stones. I'm sure he was pointing to stones there along the edge of the Jordan River. Here, God could raise up seed of Abraham out of these stones. John said, I baptize you with water. And now he points to what is coming next. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I'm sure some people, when they heard that, they wondered, John, really? You have come in what we see as the spirit of Elijah. You're a fiery preacher, a mighty prophet. We believe that you could probably call down fire from heaven. You've certainly called down judgment on the heads of these mighty, pompous religious leaders who are so full of themselves. But John says, there's one coming after me. If you're impressed with me, you need to just sort of grab the handrail and hold on because you're going to be bowled over absolutely. I am nothing in comparison with him. He is absolutely unparalleled. I am not fit to remove his sandals, to stoop down and to take the task of the most menial household servant. I'm not worthy for such a task. He is so very, very great. And he will bring about judgment on this world, on this earth. Then, in the concluding verses of chapter 3, we've had Jesus make his appearance in Bethlehem and then make his appearance in Egypt and then make his appearance in Nazareth as a baby and as an infant. Here, for the first time, we have Jesus making his appearance at the Jordan River and he is the unparalleled one. We have the witness of John, and we have the witness of the Old Testament in the lineage, and we have the witness of the Magi and the scriptures. Now we have something that goes even greater. Jesus arrives from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. John is absolutely bowled over by what takes place here, and he says it, what was on his heart, and what others, should they have understood truly who this was, they would also say, yes, John is right. You, the Messiah, coming to be baptized by human hands by the prophet 
John. John tried to prevent him, saying, I, I'm the one who has need to be baptized by you. It seems that everything is out of place here. You should be baptizing me rather than me baptizing you. But Jesus, wanting to fulfill all righteousness, he said to him, permit it at this time. Permit it. Jesus humbling himself, we would say, haven't you humbled yourself enough? We read out of Philippians chapter 2, how that Jesus Christ, the crown prince of heaven, left his glorious throne in order to descend into this world, but that now he has been exalted over all, having, having humbled himself even to the place of death upon a cross, a cursed death, that is, now he is highly exalted. Here he comes, having been humbled to be born of the Virgin Mary, having been humbled to escape in the night, perhaps, off to Egypt, fleeing for his life with his parents, having been humbled, not welcomed back to Bethlehem, but going to Nazareth, a place that was scorned by many, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Having come to so many and them not understanding who he is, who he was, who he is, who he will be for all eternity, Jesus, once again, he willingly humbles himself and he says, John, let it be. For in this way, we fulfill all righteousness. And John said, all right, all right. And he baptized him. Now, Jesus, he is under the water and he comes up. And we read that immediately, having come up out of the water, the heavens were opened and there was another witness. There was someone else who takes the stand and who speaks on behalf of Jesus, declaring that indeed he is the unparalleled one. Never was one baptized in the Jordan River or anywhere else like Jesus. Never was there one born so meek, so lowly, but who has been exalted over all. There is a voice that comes the Spirit of God having already descended as a dove and lighting upon Jesus, there comes this voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we have the Trinity. We have God the Father speaking. We have God the Son there incarnate. We have God the Holy Spirit coming and represent, being represented as a dove and lighting upon the Son of God, empowering him ever the more that his words might be so very mighty. Jesus, the unparalleled one. At the conclusion of one year, and the start of a new year, I would bid you to come to Jesus, the unparalleled one, and I would bid you to come and to bow before him. And I would bid you not to bring gold or frankincense or myrrh or anything else, time, energy. I would bid you to come and to lay yourself before him. All that we have, all that we are, all that we ever hope to be, is rightly laid before this one who is so great, who is so glorious, who is so mighty, who has come like no other that he might be our Redeemer.
I bid you to come to the cross of Jesus Christ and to see that in his work on your behalf and on my behalf, there is redemption, there is forgiveness, there is hope of heaven and of everlasting life, there is glory on ahead. But you must come, you must come. It's no good just to remain where you are and say, oh, that's a nice story. You need to come. Jesus Christ, he came and he called men and women to himself. He went to the tax table where Matthew was sitting and he called him. He went to the fishing boats alongside the Sea of Galilee and he said to Peter and Andrew and James and John, come and follow me. Jesus yet calls men and women to himself that we might follow him and that we might live in him. After three years, some of the disciples, they had it in their heads that they would just sort of pick up where they left off, that they would go back to whether it be fishing or something else. But having come to Jesus, they could never be the same once again. And I tell you also that when you come to Christ, life is never the same again and that we follow gladly, taking up our cross and going after the crucified. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Lord, I pray for men and women right now who have heard of the unparalleled one. I pray that you would so work in every heart and life and bring them to this word that the mighty John the Baptist spoke of. Repent, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I pray that men and women would hear this and that they would understand even now the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that they can enter in, enter into forgiveness, enter into life, enter into the freedom of shame and guilt and the penalty of sin. Lord, may there be many who would raise their hand and say, Lord, here I am while you're passing by. Don't, don't leave me out. Include me, Lord, so let it be today, today that men and women would call upon your name and truly live these mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to sing as we conclude, Hark, the herald angels sing.